Mike Ryan. In our ongoing series of Famous Turquoise Mines, we had a view on Lone Mountain, such an important turquoise mine. We had a two-part visit to the Lone Mountain Mine, and we also had a part of our series, Famous Turquoise Mines, where we looked at different looks of Lone Mountain Turquoise. Well, recently, I was contacted by Ryan Remick. Now, Ryan Remick is the son of Stan and Rosalie Remick, and the grandson of Warren and Virginia Hendricks. You know, history is ongoing. We're always learning more about the past as we move into the future. And a lot of this comes from new stories that are unearthed. And I'm always interested in the stories of turquoise. So Ryan contacted me and he had several stories about his family, but he also shared with me an article that came from a newsletter from a dealership in Caterpillar Heavy Equipment, which of course for turquoise miners can be very important. Now that article is on our blog, an article on Lone Mountain, and I encourage you to take a look at that because it's, it's really quite fascinating. It comes from the 1970s. You know, Lone Mountain was an early mine located in 1923 by Lee Hand. And uh, Lee Hand soon partnered up with Doc Wilson. And I can't think of two more important people in the history of turquoise, especially turquoise in Nevada, than Lee Hand and Doc Wilson. You know, there's a lot of phases in going from turquoise in the ground to putting it onto Indian jewelry or any jewelry. And Lee Han was probably more active in mining for turquoise than any other man in history. And um, Doc Wilson, on the other hand, was very important in the distribution of the turquoise into the Indian jewelry market. And uh, part of that reason was because in the late 1930s, Fred Peshlikai, famous Indian jeweler, set up his studio around the corner from the American Gem Company, which was Doc Wilson. And Doc at that time owned both the Lone Mountain and the Blue Gem, and that's the Blue Gem at Battle Mountain, turquoise mines. So we began to see Fred showing this beautiful uh, Lone Mountain high-grade turquoise in his jewelry. And this was really a first, because prior to this, it had been very difficult for the Native American jewelers to source turquoise of any sort, let alone high-grade turquoise. So that's why in a lot of the real older vintage jewelry, jewelry uh, Indian jewelry, we see turquoise, but it is usually not in what we would consider high-grade. Of course, for the Native Americans, any turquoise was special. Um, but we began to see the high grade in the 30s. And a lot of this was coming from Nevada. It would have been the Lone Mountain and the Blue Gem, because both of those were owned by Doc Wilson, as well as Fox, which was the largest producer ever of turquoise, although generally not in the highest grades. And then we also have Godber Burnham. So we began to see distribution. A lot of the Godber Burnham came from the Godber family. We've had uh, other videos about how this was distributed through uh, Frank Batania and others in the jewelry trade. But today I wanted to look at some jewelry featuring Lone Mountain turquoise because it's been so important in the history of Indian jewelry. So with that, let's start by looking at the man himself, Fred Peshlikai, who first started this in the late 30s with the high grade Lone Mountain. And we see this in this pin that I'm wearing. So here we see a close up of a really beautiful pin by Fred Peshlikai. As I mentioned, Fred had his studio just around the corner from Doc Wilson. So he had access to this very beautiful, high-grade Lone Mountain turquoise. So he was one of the first Native American jewelers to 
really introduce high-grade turquoise into their design. Also, he was one of the first Native American jewelers to introduce a new lighter style. The traditional vintage jewelry of especially the Navajo uh, jewelers had been a much heavier style, which was favored uh, by the Diné on the reservation. Uh, Fred was really creating this for a tourist market, a developing tourist market, that really wanted a lighter style. So he was really instrumental in implementing the use of, of uh, split shank and wire, adding a stylized embellishment to his design and really creating, sort of setting the platform for the development of Native American jewelry into really a true world-class art form. So uh, this is Fred Peshlakai pin with the high-grade Lone Mountain Turquoise. And you can see a lot of Fred's work at the Wheelwright Museum of the American Indian in Santa Fe. So let's take a look at some more beautiful Indian jewelry using high-grade Lone Mountain Turquoise. In this first grouping, we see three really beautiful bolos and an, and a pendant. And starting over here, we see this bolo is by Julian Lovato, as is the pendant, and both of them featuring this really beautiful gem grade Lone Mountain Dark Web, which really remains, I think, really the preferred look for Lone Mountain. This bolo is interesting. This is the first piece of Indian jewelry that I ever bought back in the 1970s. And I'm certainly glad I did. It just displays the elegant simplicity of design that Julian Lovato was known for, as well as using only the finest high-grade turquoise and other gemstones. On this side, we see some, some beautiful Lone Mountain in a bolo by Verma Nequatua. These stones came from a bolo that was a personal bolo of Don Hole, of Hole Trading in Sedona, Arizona. And for whatever reason, the stones were removed from Don's bolo, and I repurposed them here in this beautiful bolo by Verma. This bolo is really interesting. It's uh, by Preston Monange, Coco Pelli, with a beautiful look for Lone Mountain, and that is the uh, lighter blue in more of a, of a brown webbed matrix. Um, it is a well-known look for Lone Mountain and very, very beautiful uh, desired look. This uh, was interesting. I, I purchased this uh, bolo uh, on uh, one of the social, not social media, but one on the online platforms. I think it was probably uh, eBay. And you know, when you buy there, you're never quite sure what you're getting. So I sent the bolo to uh, Jesse Monangi, who's Preston's son, to find out, is this really by Preston? He said, yes, it is, but it really needs some work. Would you like for me? And I think he used the term clean it up. Well, he proceeded to add the booties, the moccasins down here with the little diamond uh, accessory. He added the gold flute, the nice little jewelry with these beautiful um, uh, Sleeping Beauty uh, looks here on the jewelry that Coco Pelli is wearing. A little diamond in the, in the eyeball for Coco Pelli. And then probably most important, it now has the hallmark of father and son, both Preston and uh, Jesse. So I, I really do value this. It's a very, very important piece of jewelry, again, showing the importance of Lone Mountain Turquoise. In this uh, second grouping, we have two bracelets, two cuffs, and a beautiful buckle. Uh, this bracelet here is very interesting because it's made by Wes Willie, and I had purchased a bolo from Wes, and I wanted a, a, a similar looking uh, cuff to accompany it. So I contacted Wes and he had some Lone Mountain Turquoise 
that was interesting because it had pyrite in it. Well, I'd never heard about pyrite in Lone Mountain Turquoise, so I inquired about it and I contacted Tristine Smith, who with uh, her husband uh, owned the Lone Mountain Turquoise mine. So I asked her and, and she said, oh yes, I told him not to sell that to Wes. We had a little bit with the pyrite in it. So <laughs> it is a Lone Mountain Turquoise and it has this kind of rough cut, which I think works very well because you can, you can see the pyrite in it. On the other hand here, we see our friend Fred Peschlikai again. Now, unlike the uh, pen that is signed, this bracelet is not signed. And that's not surprising because about a third of all of Fred's work was not signed. But uh, we've had it from some experts in Fred's jewelry that this is very probably comes from Fred Peschlikai because it just demonstrates all of the characteristics of his work, including the use of the very high grade Lone Mountain Turquoise. Finally, we see this very special buckle here in the center, which is uh, uh, Lee Yazi. And Lee, of course, is known for a lot of his in inlay work. He worked closely in the early days with Preston Manangi doing inlay for Preston. But here we see some work, fabricated work with some, some beautiful uh, buckle, just featuring this very, very high grade, gem grade, I would say, Lone Mountain Turquoise set in this wonderful cluster setting in the buckle. So again, uh, in, in, an exa some examples of how important Lone Mountain Turquoise has been in fine Native American jewelry. Finally, we see this really quite amazing nugget necklace of high grade uh, Lone Mountain nuggets. And this is very, very rare. When I purchased this, I took it to Gene Waddell, who's had ownership and involvement at Lone Mountain since the late 1970s. And I asked him about this and he said, well, yeah, it, it certainly is Lone Mountain. And he said, we really haven't seen nuggets of that size, especially this one big nugget down here since the Menless Winfield days. So we're really thinking this is most probably comes from the Menless Winfield period of ownership of the Lone Mountain Mine. You can see a really beautiful photo of this in the Turquoise Gallery in Turquoise in America, part two, a beautiful Arlen Ben photograph, which much better than what I'm taking here with this video. But I hope this has given everyone an idea of how important Lone Mountain Turquoise has been in Native American jewelry.